guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome to my channel. Please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe below. On this video, I'm going to be covering immobility, so let's just jump right into the questions. Question number one. A client's been on prolonged bed rest and the nurse is observing for signs associated with immobility. In assessment of the client, the nurse is alert to, and one, increase in blood pressure, two, decreased heart rate, three, increased urine output, or four, decreased peristalsis. If you're new to my channel, I always give you guys a moment to think of your answer. If you know you read a little bit slower or you need a little bit more time to look through the choices, be sure just to pause so that I don't already give you the answer before you have a chance to formulate your own answer, okay? So guys, just pause it for your own well. So the correct answer for this is number four, decreased peristalsis. So let me explain something to you guys. When the patient has been immobile, okay, they haven't been able to get up and move around, everything slows down, okay? Blood circulation slows down. That's why patients who've been immobile, they're at risk for what? Blood clots, because we know when blood's not moving, it does what? It clots, okay? The patient's at risk for decubitus ulcers because um, they're putting pressure on that area, okay? What else goes down? Blood pressure. The blood pressure starts to drop and that's why it's so important if a patient's been immobile, you know, before you get them up, you gotta dangle them to prevent orthostatic hypotension. You get them up slowly. What else slows down? The gut peristalsis. So patients who are immobile, they're at risk for constipation and the list goes on. Okay. So that's why number four is the correct answer. We're going to watch out for decreased peristalsis, which places that patient um, at risk for constipation. So patients who are immobile, what do they need? Lots of fluid, fiber, right? To help uh, decrease that risk of constipation. All right, number two, a 61-year-old client suffered left-sided paralysis from a cerebral vascular accident, a stroke. In planning care for this client, the nurse implements which one of the following as an appropriate intervention? One, encourage an even gait when walking in place. Two, assess the extremities for unilateral swelling and muscle atrophy. Three, encourage holding the breath frequently to hyperinflate the lungs. Four, teach the use of a two-point crutch technique for ambulation. I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And guys, the correct answer is number two, assess the extremities for unilateral swelling and muscle atrophy. So think about what's happening here. That patient had a stroke, they're having um, excuse me, uh, the residual effect is one-sided paralysis. What's the saying? Left side. Okay. So patients having left-sided paralysis. What does that mean? On their left side, it's basically what? Immobile. They're really not moving it that much. It's paralyzed. Okay. When muscles aren't being used, they shrink. This is what's known as atrophy. Okay. So this arm, the side's not being used. So those muscles start to shrink. And what else happens? Remember I told you when the patient's not moving, what happens with the blood? It slows down, okay? Fluid movement slows down. So you have swelling on that side. So if the patient has their arm or if it's their leg, it's in a dependent position. All of the fluid, all of the blood that's supposed to go back up to the heart, what does it do? It stays down, okay? It doesn't move back up. So that's why you see the swelling. And the muscle is so weak because it's not being exercised, it's not being used, it starts to uh, shrivel up. That's what's known as the atrophy. So we expect to see unilateral, that means one side, wherever that immobility is, wherever that paralysis is, that one side. We expect to see uni unilateral swelling and muscle atrophy. A client's leaving for surgery and because of preoperative sedation needs complete assistance to transfer from bed to the stretcher. Which of the following should the nurse do first? One, elevate the head of the bed. Two, explain the procedure to the client. Three, place the client in prone position. Or four, assess the situation for any potentially unsafe complications. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is four. Guys, don't forget, 
ADPI, A-D-P-I-E, Assessment, Diagnosis, Planning, Intervention, Evaluation. So the very first thing that you're going to do is assess. You're going to assess the situation. Is the wheelchair locked? Is the patient, are the patient's legs trembling? Is the patient obese? Are they heavy? Are you going to need another nurse to help? You're going to assess the situation first to see what you're going to do for the patient, what your implementation is going to be, okay? So that's why uh, number four is the correct answer. Next question. An immobilized client is suspected of having atelectasis. This is assessed by the nurse upon auscultation as one, harsh crackles, two, wheezing on inspiration, three, diminished breath sounds, four, bronchovesicular whooshing. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, diminished breath sound. So patient who has atelectasis, that's a collapse of the lungs, okay? But let me be more specific. That's collapse of the lungs where gas exchange takes place, okay? Where oxygen, carbon dioxide is um, supposed to be exchanging. So you're going to hear diminished breath sounds. Why? Because that patient's not breathing the way they're supposed to. Look at our other choices, harsh crack crackles. When you hear crackles, that means there's fluids, fluid in the lungs and there should never be fluid in the lungs. So you're going to hear crackles in a situation like if the patient were to have pneumonia, they have fluid in the lungs. Wheezing on inspiration. Patients, and when you hear wheezing, that means that the airway, the patient's having limited airway. An example of that would be like if the patient had asthma, okay? Bronchovesicular whooshing, I couldn't even tell you. Somebody look it up, put in a comment, let me know. Um, so we're going to move on to the next question. The best approach for the nurse to use uh, to assess the presence of thrombosis in an immobilized client is to one, measure calf and thigh circumference. Two, attempt to elicit the home and sign. Three, palpate the temperature of the feet. Four, observe for a loss of hair and skin turgor in the lower legs. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is one, guys. Measure the calf and thigh circumference. So let me take it a step further. Yes, you want to measure the calf. Yes, you want to measure the thigh circumference. But guess what? You have to also measure the unaffected thigh and calf. Why? You need a baseline for reference, okay? You're not going to know if that area has increased at all if you haven't been able to compare, okay? So when a patient has thrombosis, you're expecting to see swelling. You're expecting the patient to have pain. They're going to have that in the affected leg, but they're not going to have it in the unaffected leg. You see number two, attempt to listen home and sign. I'm about to age myself, guys. We used to do this about 15 years ago. This was done, but evidence-based practice has shown that this is not reliable because lots of patients who have thrombosis do not elicit a home and sign. Okay, so that's... Um, it's not reliable. We don't do that anymore. We may um, elicit a home and sign to elicit to see if they have it, but it's not diagnostic. If a patient's home and sign is positive, that does not necessarily mean, yes, they have a thrombosis. Three, palpate the temperature of the feet. Guys, come on. Palpating the temperature of feet will tell you nothing, okay? And then you have four, observe for loss of hair and skin turgor of the lower legs. Let me tell you what that tells you. When you see the patient has a loss of hair in the lower extremities, that lets you know that their circulation is decreased, okay? Oxygen is carried in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is carried in the blood. The blood is what goes to the lower extremities and that's how the hair on the legs is fed. It feeds off of the nutrients that are in the blood. So if there's decreased circulation, there's not gonna be much hair on that lower leg, okay? And the other portion of choice number four, where it says skin turgor of the lower legs, guys, skin turgor tells us how hydrated the patient is. Okay, if the skin turgor is more than three seconds, that's the symptom of possible dehydration. If it's less than three seconds, it's a sign that the patient's adequately hydrated. Next question. Clients getting up for the first time after a period of bed rest. The nurse should first, one, assess respiratory function, 
Two, obtain a baseline blood pressure. Three, assist the client with sitting at the edge of the bed. Four, ask the client if he or she feels lightheaded. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is number two. Guys, I hope you were not tricked by number one. Because let me tell you something. These test writers will try to trick you just like this. Just like this. They put the word assess so you can jump on it. But guys, you have to use critical thinking, okay? Critical thinking is what's the difference between you and a CNA or you and an unlicensed assistive personnel. Because remember, unlicensed assistive personnel, they don't use critical thinking, okay? Everything that they're allowed to do is, <coughs> excuse me, mechanical, okay? But you have to use critical thinking. So just because you saw the word assess, don't jump on it. It needs to make sense. So this client has been immobilized. They've been on bed rest for a long time. What's the first thing you're going to do? Get a baseline blood pressure. And guess what? Getting a blood pressure is a form of assessment. You caught that? Anything that you do that gathers information is a form of assessment. So don't only look for the word assessment, okay? Anything that gathers information. So you checking that patient's chart is a form of assessment. You looking at that patient physically is a form of assessment. You asking that patient or family questions is a form of assessment, okay? So the correct answer is number two. You want to get a blood pressure. Why? If they've been lying in that bed for a long time, we're concerned about orthostatic hypotension, okay? Their blood pressure already being low, because remember I told you, if a patient's immobilized, their blood pressure slows down, right? It goes down. So we're worried about the minute we stand them up, the blood pressure drops and that patient might pass out. That patient might fall. So what you're concerned about is taking a blood pressure, not assessing respiratory function. Okay, assessing respiratory function, that's wonderful, but that's not something you're gonna assess if a patient's been immobile and you want to get them up. Your concern at that point is orthostatic hypotension. Number three, assist them with sitting at the edge of the bed. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. You want them to sit at the edge of, edge of the bed. You want them to dangle their feet because that's gonna help their body get adjusted so when they stand up, that blood pressure doesn't go down. That's wonderful, right? But it doesn't come first. The first thing you're going to do is get a baseline blood pressure. And of course, number four, ask the client if he or she feels lightheaded. That's wonderful. You can ask that, but that's not a priority. That's something subjective. That's not something you can measure. But the blood pressure is objective. That gives us something definite that we know where that patient is, hemodynamically speaking. Okay? Next question. To promote respiratory function in the mobilized client, the nurse should, one, change the client's position every four to eight hours. Two, encourage deep breathing and coughing every hour. Three, use oxygen nebulizer treatments regularly. Or four, suction the client's secretions every hour. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is to encourage deep breathing and coughing every hour. So to promote respiratory function, guys, the reason you want them coughing and deep breathing, it promotes inflation and expansion of the lungs. Those are lung exercises, so those lungs get stronger. The more that the lungs expand, the less risk that patient will be at, the less risk that patient will be in getting an infection such as pneumonia, okay? So that's what's most important. Turn, cough, deep breathe. Let's go over these other choices. One, changing the position every four to eight hours. Actually, you want to change that patient every two hours. And getting them to turn every two hours, that's wonderful. That inc helps increase circulation and that decreases their risk of getting blood clots. Choice number three, use oxygen and nebulizer treatments regularly. Uh, no. First of all, we're gonna give oxygen as needed if that patient's O2 stats is down, okay? That's not gonna really help us with their uh, respiratory function. Giving them oxygen, yes, that helps with perfusion, but that does not help the lungs itself in working. And the other portion of number three was where it says nebulizer treatments regularly, no. Patients get nebulizer treatments as needed, okay? And number four, same thing, suction of clients' suc um, secretions every hour. 
Patients are suctioned as needed, okay? Because every time you suction a patient, you're taking away what? Yes, you're getting rid of the mucus, but you're also taking, getting, uh, taking away oxygen. And plus, suctioning the patient does nothing for the function of the lungs. This question's asking us what helps the lungs function more. And the correct answer is them coughing and deep breathing because it helps the lungs expand. Antiembolic stockings, also known as TED hose, are ordered for a client on bed rest following surgery. The nurse explains to the client that the primary purpose for TEDs is to one, keep the skin warm and dry, two, prevent abnormal joint flexion, three, apply external pressure, or four, prevent bleeding. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, apply external pressure. So what happens is those TED holes, which are really tight, they apply pressure. And so that what that pressure does, it pushes the blood to go back up to the heart. Because what happens, remember, patients are mobile. Remember what I told you, when they're immobile, blood does what? Slow down. When blood slows down, it does what? It clots. So what happens is when it applies pressure on that leg, it forces the blood to move up back to the heart and it decreases that patient's risk of getting a uh, blood clot. Something else you have to know about these TED holes, um, they have to be placed on the patient in the morning before they get out of bed because that's the test question. I see it all the time. Okay, so those 10 compression stockings must be placed on the patient in the morning before they get out of bed and they're taken off at in the evening before they go to sleep, okay? Next question. To provide for the psychosocial needs of an immobilized client, an appropriate statement by the nurse will be which of the following? One, the staff will limit your visitors so that you will not be bothered. Two, a roommate can be a real bother. You'd probably rather have a private room. Three, let's discuss the routine to see if there are any changes we can make. Or four, I think you should have your hair done and put on some makeup. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So guys, the correct answer is three. Let's discuss the routine to see if there are any changes we can make. So number one, what's so great about this answer is that you're getting that patient involved, okay? It said let's, so that means you and me. Let's discuss the routine to see what changes we can make. That helps that patient psychosocial, okay? Because they don't, they, they feel like they're having a sense of control in the situation, okay? They feel like they're part of uh, treatment. And the second thing, when you say let's discuss, you're allowing that patient to express themselves. That helps them, okay? Let's look at our other choices. One, the staff will limit your visitors so you'll not be bothered. How, how does that help the patient? That doesn't even give the patient a chance to discuss their feelings or express their feelings. Number two, a roommate can be a bother. You'd probably rather have a, a private room. Again, that really doesn't allow um, the patient to be able to express their feelings. And then number four, I think you should have your hair done to put on some makeup. What did I tell you guys about giving your opinion? As a nurse, you never give your opinion, ever, okay? So the correct answer is the one that you, you're going to um, involve the patient in the care and give them a chance to express their feelings, which is number three. Next question, which of the following clients is most at risk for losing his or her balance? One, a woman who's nine months pregnant walking down a flight of stairs. Two, 16-year-old skateboarding down a 15-degree slope. Three, 45-year-old taking hypertensive medication. Or four, a four-year-old riding a tricycle. I'll give you a moment. And the correct answer, guys, is number one, the, nine, uh, the woman who's nine months pregnant walking down the flight of stairs. So guys, this woman is nine months, so her belly's huge. It's out there, guys. That woman who's pregnant, because of um, the increase in the size of her abdomen, her center, her center of gravity has shifted, okay? So she's a fall risk walking on flight, uh, flat surfaces, but now she's walking downstairs, that makes her double a risk, okay? That's why she's more of a risk than anybody else. Because of the pregnancy, 
her center of gravity has shifted, okay? So just her being pregnant and that's belly being out there, that places her at risk. The other choices, 16-year-old uh, uh, boarding down a 15-degree slope, that's not even um, a, a big angle. We're not too concerned about that. A client taking hypertensive medication. Yeah, I'm, uh, hypertensive medication and brings down your blood pressure, but they really didn't give us any more information that would make that patient a risk and a four-year-old riding a tricycle. So uh, by far, the woman who's nine months so nine months, the woman who's pregnant nine months is at high risk for falls. Next question. It's been determined that all of the following clients are at risk for falling. Which one requires the nurse's priority for ambulation? One, 16-year-old with a sprained ankle being discharged from the emergency department. Two, 54-year-old who's taken the initial dose of an antihypertensive medication. Three, 45-year-old post-op client up for the first time since knee surgery. Or four, 81-year-old who's asthmatic and had a hip replaced 18 months ago. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, so the correct answer is three, the 45-year-old post-op client up for the first time since knee surgery. Why? Number one, post-op. Patient just came from surgery, right? So they had anesthesia, okay? That alone places them as a fall risk. Any patient that's post-op, they're automatically a fall risk. And then what else? They just had knee surgery, Okay, you need your knees to walk, right? So that also places them at a fall risk. So this patient has two risk factors that places them as fall risk. Let's look at our other choices. The question was asking um, which one requires the nurse's priority for ambulation, and it's still number three. So number three is the greatest fall risk out of all of these choices. But on top of that, the nurse is going to go to this patient first for ambulation, and here's why. Remember guys, if you have not watched my priority video, please go back and watch it. I go over who's a priority, who do you see first, and I explain why. And number three is a perfect example of a priority patient. Who are you gonna go to first? Any patient that is post-op. Why? When a patient is your patient, they leave for surgery or they leave for a diagnostic test, they leave your floor for whatever reason, and then they come back to you, you have to consider that patient as a brand new patient. You have to go see that patient first, okay? Because you have lots of assessments to do. So this patient who just came from um, surgery, and that's another thing I talked about in this video, patient comes from surgery, you have three priorities when those patients are post-op. You have three things you're worried about. You're worried about infection, you're worried about DVT and pulmonary embolism, and you're worried about that patient hemorrhaging out. So the reason we're running to that patient besides them just coming back to us and we have to do an assessment, the reason we're running to that patient to get them to ambulate is because we don't want that patient to get a DVT or a pulmonary embolism. What did I say to you? When the patient's not moving, blood slows down. When blood slows down, it starts to what? Clot. So the reason you want that patient moving around is when that patient's walking, when that patient's moving, it forces the blood that was in the lower extremities to come back up to the heart. It, it acts like a TED hose. We just talked about the compression stockings. When the patient's walking, okay, those muscles are constricting, okay? They're, they're, um, they're pushing up against the vessel and they're forcing the blood that wanted to pull, it's forcing the blood to go back up to the heart. So that decreases the patient's risk for um, DVT slash PE. Okay, so those patients that are post-op, you want them moving around. You don't want them just lying down in bed because they're lying down in bed. They're at high risk for giving a DVT pulmonary embolism. They're at high risk for infections such as pneumonia. Next question. Which of the following statements regarding physical activity and its effect on activity tolerance made by a client shows the most informed knowledge regarding the connection between the two? One. I know I need to walk more if I want to get stronger. Two, I don't like walking, but I do it because I know it will make me stronger. Three, I try to walk a little farther each afternoon so I can dance at my grandson's wedding. 
four, I walk with my son three evenings a week because it's good for his weight and for my bones. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three. I try to walk a little farther each afternoon so I can dance at my grandson's wedding. Guys, the key phrase in the question is activity and is activity tolerance. Okay. What does that mean? Activity tolerance. That means when the patient's doing the activity, if they get tolerance, they can do more and more each day. And that's number three. I try to walk a little farther each afternoon. Okay. So that key phrase in the question that you should have looked, saw was activity tolerance. Okay. And that's what made you know the correct answer was number three. Next question, a 16-year-old had a full leg cast for four months and is, it is being removed today. Which of the following statements made by the client shows the most informed understanding of the effects of immobilization of a muscle on its strength and stamina? One, I'm hoping to be back at soccer practice in three weeks. Two, walking and riding my bike will help regain the muscle. Three, I'll practice the strengthening routine the physical therapy therapist taught me so I can play baseball in the spring. Four, it was, it was a good bit of muscle and strength loss, but I'll work at getting it back like it was before the break. And I'll give you a moment, moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, guys. I'll practice strengthening routine. The, the physical therapist taught me so I can play baseball in the spring. And this kind of um, just reflects what I talked to you guys about earlier when a patient's been immobilized, what happens to that muscle? It starts to shrink, it gets weak, okay? And so you have to do strengthening exercises to get, get it back to where it was. Next question, which of the following statements made by a nurse caring for a client who experienced a myocardial infarction eight hours ago shows the greatest insight as to the purpose for keeping the client on bed rest? One, the client has been exhausting. She needs a period of uninterrupted rest. Two, the pain she experienced is exhausting. It's imperative that she rest. Three, keeping her on bed rest decreases the need her body has for oxygen. Or four, she needs complete bed rest. She's very ill, especially her heart. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And guys, the correct answer is number three, keeping her on bed rest, dec bed rest decreases the need her body has for oxygen. So let me explain something to you guys. When a patient has a myocardial infarction, okay, that's a heart attack. The priority in care for that patient is to decrease their oxygen demand, okay? To decrease the demand on the heart. Why? Let me explain something to you. When you're moving about, you're walking or you're running, you're moving, right? The demand of your body for oxygen goes up. Your body needs more oxygen because it needs to be fed, right? Well, guess which organ is the organ that's responsible for supplying that oxygen? The heart. The heart is what pumps blood to every single organ of your body, your kidneys, your spleen, your heart, your eyeballs, okay? Every single organ of your body. So if the patient had a heart attack, you want them to rest that heart you got to rest that body because if they're walking, they're moving about the demand for oxygen, vitamins, nutrients goes up and the heart is the one that's responsible for supplying it. Okay. So that's why it's important to decrease the demand of the body so that it decreases demand on the heart. Okay. In uh, when a patient has a heart attack, um, what we give and uh, the mnemonic is Mona M O N A M is morphine. 
Morphine does two things. Number one, it decreases that pain that the patient has. And number two, it decreases the oxygen demand. And here's why. When the patient's in pain, oh, oh my heart, my heart, oh, they're in pain. Guess what happens? The demand increases, which makes the heart have to work right? So we give them Mona to decrease the pain, but also decrease um, that demand. O is oxygen. Remember, Mona, M-O-N-A. M is morphine. O is oxygen. We give that patient oxygen so that that heart can rest a little bit more. It doesn't have to work as hard to pump out blood because remember, oxygen is in the blood. If any organ, any tissue wants oxygen, it gets it from the blood. Who's responsible for pumping out the blood? The heart. So we give the patient oxygen so that the heart can rest. What does the N stands for? M-O-N. N is for nitroglycerin, okay? What nitroglycerin does? It dilates the vessels, okay? It helps the blood pressure go down. It dilates the vessels. And the last thing we give is aspirin. A is for aspirin. And why? Remember, that patient's gonna be immobile because we wanna decrease the demand of the heart. That patient's at risk for what? Clotting. What is as what's the effect of aspirin? Antiplatelet. Okay? So remember when it comes to myocardial infarction, M-O-N-A, morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. And all of that is given again to decrease the oxygen demands on the heart. Last question, a 78 year old inactive client diagnosed with acute renal failure is at risk for which of the following skeletal maladies? One, rickets, two, osteomyelitis, three, pathological fractures of the long bones, or four, compression fractures of the spinal column. And I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, the correct answer is three, pathological fractures of the long bone. Why? I want you to think of this. The patient is inactive. They're not moving. They're renal failure. So let me explain to you what's happening. Another um, complication of a patient who's been immobile for a long time is their bones can get porous and weak. And let me explain to you why. The bone is strong because of calcium, okay? How does calcium get into the bones? By activity, walking, jogging, any weight-bearing exercises, it pushes the calcium that was originally in the blood and it puts it in the bone so the bone can be strong. But what happens if the patient's immobile? They're not walking, they're not jogging, they're not doing any weight-bearing exercises. That calcium that was in the bone goes back to the blood. So what happens to the bone? It gets porous, it gets weak, and it places that patient at risk for fractures. So let's look at our other choices. One, rickets. Guys, rickets is soft bones, but this is your key. It's soft bones, not because of lack of calcium. It's soft bones because lack of vitamin D. When you see that word rickets, I want you to think of vitamin D deficiency, okay? Not calcium, vitamin D. Two, osteomyelitis, that is an infection of the bone that has nothing to do with what we're talking about now. And uh, four, compression fracture of the spinal column. This is something that happens, a compression fracture is a fracture that when, the, when the spinal column has been compressed. That's something that would happen like in an MVA, like a motor vehicle accident or some other high impact, impact um, incident, okay? So guys, those are our questions for immobility. I hope you found them to be helpful. These concepts, these concepts and questions, I picked them specifically because those are questions, the concepts of those questions, not the exact questions, guys, but those concepts are what I tend to see as test questions over and over and over again. So they're very important concepts for you guys to understand. Guys, if you want to keep these videos and content coming, please do not forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.